Okay, ladies and does it work? Um, so I need myself the Hello? Hello? Okay. I think we have channel three here. Um, everything is running late, uh, but ladies and gentlemen, let's start the session now on the uh, Internet of Things. Welcome, and uh, I'm very thankful that, um, you know, um, we have now a very excellent uh, panel here of high-level experts. Uh, we have some uh, last minute changes and also substitutes. You know, I have to apologize that Fiona Alexander from the US Department of Commerce is not able to come because she has left already today. Uh, we miss also Bob Khan uh, because he could not travel to Azerbaijan. And uh, we are still waiting for, for Hong. But anyhow, you know, we have a very distinguished panel here. It starts with um, Latif. Uh, Mr. IP version 6 already since more than 10, 15 years. Uh, Jeff Houston from APNIC. Uh, Megan Richards from the European Commission. Uh, Martin Bodermann is a substitute. He was not mentioned in the program, but he has joined uh, now this panel and he is a board member of the um, uh, PEER, the Public Internet Registry. And Rolf Weber from the University of Zurich, who is also a member of the EU uh, Internet of Things Task Force. So we had uh, also, we have Avri Doria, she has preferred to sit in the, in the background and she will give us a little bit um, introduction because she's also deeply involved in the, um, um, was deeply involved into the, um, one of the research projects of the European Commission on the uh, um, Euro and F, the network of the future, where we had a special research project on the governance dimension of the Internet of Things. We did this workshop, uh, a similar workshop, uh, one year ago in Nairobi, and we decided that the subject, you know, is still needs more clarification, needs more discussion. Internet of Things is a rather vague, vague um, project, which is not yet really defined. What does it mean? Um, it started in around 10 years ago when uh, it became clear that there is an opportunity to link objects to the internet. Uh, and there was a combination of two different things. On the one hand, you know, we know the barcode, uh, which has a lot of information on a lot of objects, but the barcode was, um, you know, not yet linked to the internet. But with the emergence of RFID chips and then the allocation of IP addresses to objects, this changed um, the situation. And so 
around seven or eight years ago, some people said, okay, this is a new dimension of the Internet, and they called it the Internet of Things, in contrast to um, the Internet of Computers or Internet of People. So, and since that, we tried to find out, you know, what really the Internet of Things is, whether it's only a new application, like you see other applications, search engines, social networks, or whatever comes out uh, on top services, uh, or whether this is really something new. Um, the French government a couple of years ago uh, had the idea that the ONS, the object naming uh, numbering system, um, it looks rather similar like the DNS, the domain name system, and while we'll have a mechanism for the domain name system, though the idea was probably we need also something for the ONS, the, the, the object. Uh, naming system. And we had a long discussion about whether we need one route or uh, like in the DNS or whether it should be a federated route or things like that. And the European Commission was very helpful in, you know, promoting research uh, to get more knowledge about this. And the Commissioner Cruz created a task force uh, uh, two years ago and to find out, you know, what are the various dimensions. So certainly the business perspectives is a great opportunity and you have a lot of other opportunities where you can introduce new services, new applications which bring um, more opportunities and more choices to users and create new options for all kinds of small, medium size and also big, big corporations. So we c uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for the future. But uh, it has also some implications, particular for privacy, for security. And so the question was then also, you know, is there a need for a special governance structure? And uh, within the um, various projects of the European uh, Commission, there were, came out with two different approaches. One group said, yes, there is a need for IoT governance, and we have to create a new mechanism to govern the Internet of Things. The group was called Casacras, and just recently in a meeting in Venice in, 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 in June this year, they proposed the establishment of a new international organization or even an intergovernmental organization for the management of the Internet of Things. And there was another research group where Afri and I was involved uh, in the UNF, which said, no, the Internet of Things governance is just um, not different from the Internet governance we have. There is no need for a special mechanism. It's too premature. So it makes no sense to start with um, a governance mechanism um, when it's still unclear what the Internet of Things is indeed. And we have no except definition. And we also argued that the privacy issue uh, raised in the Internet of Things, which are serious issues, are not so fundamentally different from privacy issues in social networks and in search engines. And so that means we do not see that the Internet of Things is so different from the Internet that it needs a different mechanisms. And our conclusion was that the existing Internet governance ecosystem can accommodate uh, all elements which are raised by the Internet of Things and there is no need, at least at this stage, um, to move forward towards the uh, establishment of a new mechanism or a new organization. So this is more or less where we are here today. So we have not yet a clear consensus, a clear understanding, A, what the Internet of Things is and what the governance dimension of an Internet of Things could be. And that's why I am you know, what, want to turn this workshop more into a brainstorming so that we will not present already fixed results, but you know, we will discuss this from various issues. And I think all the people here on the podium um, have uh, enough knowledge. And my understanding is that Megan Richards have to leave um, already in a couple of minutes. And so I would uh, just ask her to, um, to uh, start and to give us a little bit the background what the European Commission has done and uh, what the plans are. Because after the restructuring of the um, DG Connect now, um, the Internet of Things disappeared a little bit as a priority and now cloud computing is more important so it would be certainly of interest for the community here to understand what the midterm plans of the European Union are. Thank you Megan.
Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, Wolfgang, thank you for, for inviting me. And thank you for promoting me as well. I see that I'm now Deputy Director General, which is, I was acting for, for quite a long time, most of this year, but I, I'm not actually the deputy. But um, So le let me just reassure those of you who have an interest in this. Uh, uh, the Internet of Things is still very much, <coughs> excuse me, something that we, are very much interested in, in uh, the European Commission and we have uh, a proposal to write a European Commission uh, communication on the governance of the Internet of Things which I think I spoke to you about at the last, last year's IGF to tell you a little bit about where we were and what was going on. We have uh, an expert working group on the Internet of Things which is divided into a number of subgroups looking at issues such as personal data, ethics, standardization, etc. And these are, of course, very important aspects to look at how the Internet of Things works, what are the implications, etc. It was never intended, and I think Wolfgang said quite clearly that this is the case, it was never intended to develop a new and separate or uh, parallel uh, Internet of Things governance group or structure. The question is that because of the nature of the interconnection of things and the interconnection between people and things, uh, there are a certain number of issues, as I mentioned, personal data, standardization, ethics, etc., that should be looked at perhaps in a little bit more depth, and the particular aspects that I are identified and attached to those um, issues. So that's what the expert group has been looking at, and it's been working for at least a year, uh, perhaps a bit more now, uh, Wolfgang probably remembers the exact dates. Um, with the, and, and I used to be responsible for the directorate that was looking after this uh, uh, expert group, and as I said, it's continuing to, to, to work, with a view, as I said, to developing a, a communication of the European Commission on governance of the Internet of Things in the European context. Um, with the reorganization of our Directorate General, and you don't want to know all the gory details of how, why, where, uh, the Internet of Things continues to be uh, a priority. We continue to work on the expert group. The problem that is perhaps perceived by some of you in terms of its prominence or its identity or uh, the, the awareness of Internet of Things is perhaps because the activity on Internet of Things is now in the unit that is looking after um, Internet security. And that group of people has been very much uh, occupied over the last few months, and particularly since the reorganization came into effect, which was 1st of July. That group has been very much occupied with developing a commission communication on internet security. And this is why perhaps some of you haven't seen so much activity or have perceived that there's not so much activity in Internet of Things or that it doesn't seem to be as important. It continues to be important, we continue to do the work, but I think some of these other issues like uh, the internet security uh, communication and of course the cloud computing strategy have been perceived as taking over perhaps a little bit uh, of the work. That doesn't mean we have lost interest or we're not continuing to work uh, as much as, as possible on it. But these other issues are, are certainly politically very active and, and perhaps taking a bit more, more interest. So that's where we are. The uh, working group continues to, it's very active. And I, we had originally hoped that this communication on governance of the Internet of Things would be ready by the end of, well, I think our original planning was the first quarter of 2013. And uh, that planning is still, and we had hoped that we might even be able to advance to the end of this year. But I think we, we keep uh, still early 2013, let's put it that way. First half of 2013 is, is where we plan to have uh, a communication. Okay, thank you very much. This brings more light into the process. Uh, Professor Rolf Weber from the University of Zurich is a member of this task force. And uh, so he's also in the subgroup for IoT governance. And probably, Rolf, you can a little bit summarize uh, what has been done so far and what are your um, prospects for the future. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. I appreciate, uh, in fact, uh, that 
uh, Megan has given some kind of commitment uh, to the work related uh, to IIT because as it has been said, the relatively large group uh, was uh, met maybe four times a year was correctly split into I think five um, groups at the beginning and afterwards even a sixth subgroup has been established uh, on ethics and uh, subgroups are looking at privacy security, at standardization as has been said, uh, also um, at uh, governance and uh, in fact in uh, early uh, uh, spring of uh, this year um, some uh, kind of uh, special questionnaire has been submitted to the public and uh, a couple of uh, answers uh, have been uh, collected. However, probably as a member of this group, I should also say that in the recent uh, past, we did not too much have the impression that we would be uh, backed. Uh, so the last meeting has been canceled which was scheduled for September. The next meeting scheduled for next week has been uh, shortened. And uh, uh, insofar, it might have been caused by a coincidence of uh, incidents like restructuring, like the emphasis on uh, internet uh, security. But uh, nevertheless, and uh, not to be understood as a critical mark, just as a perception on the side of the members of the um, working uh, group somehow, the drive uh, was not anymore as strong as uh, it has been and uh, members of the group still do not uh, know, uh, for example, the final uh, outcome of the responses uh, to the uh, questionnaire. And probably next week we are going uh, to see how uh, the various elements uh, are to uh, be uh, taken up. As far as uh, uh, governance uh, in uh, particular, uh, is a concern, I think I should say, to be fair, that uh, not a, a specific scheme of governance uh, is envisaged uh, to be proposed by the uh, experts, as uh, Wolfgang already mentioned at the very um, beginning, probably the skepticism amongst uh, the members of the expert uh, group being involved in law as myself or political media science as uh, Wolfgang uh, is uh, at least uh, not weak uh, to say it uh, in reluctant uh, terms and we rather think that specific uh, topics should be um, uh, tackled that uh, privacy standards need to be uh, strengthened that of course standardization is uh, very important and I do not want uh, somehow to monopolize now the discussion but I think we should also look uh, much closer at uh, competition law which has not yet been done. I think I leave it uh, at that for the time being. Thank you very much and I think uh, Rolf's uh, statements reflects a little bit the, um, that we are still struggling with the basics, the understanding what is exactly the Internet of Things and what are the needed actions and the postponement of the communication of the European Commission indicates also, sorry? Okay, okay can you speak to the microphone? Sorry, the, the uh, communication has not been postponed. It was always foreseen for early 2013. That was always our target. Uh, I think first quarter of 2013. And as I said, uh, it's still for early 2013, whether it's still in the first quarter or closer to the second quarter, it's still early 2013. That was always our initial target. It was never planned for 2012. At one point, we had hoped that we might be able to advance it to make it in 2012, but it was never, that was never the official plan, not at all. And okay. as I said, the only reason now that perhaps it seems uh, that, and, and this is a perception, uh, it's not the, not the fact, but that it seems perhaps it's perceived as being not the very top priority is because the cyber security and internet security communication is taking so much time and so much effort and the same people are working on these two aspects so because the other one is urgent and has to be done right away perhaps you haven't seen so much visibility okay this is very helpful this clears a little bit the air however you know at least my understanding is that we 
still struggling with the basics. Okay. And last year in the workshop when Fiona Alexander was here, we discovered that the US government and European Commission you know, have not the same approach to the understanding of the Internet of Things. And Jeff Houston was also um, in the uh, uh, workshop last year. And he also, you know, from a perspective of the Asian Pacific uh, IR, he argued that um, it's just a technical service uh, and not, you know, uh, something which is so new and, and different. Jeff, probably you could reflect a little bit about how you see from um, uh, Australia, from the Australian perspective, from the South perspective, these activities of the European um, uh, Union. Uh, thanks, Wolfgang. Yes, I'm Jeff Houston. I work with the Asia Pacific Network Information Centre. Um, I'm not a citizen of an EU country. I don't enjoy EU funding for any of the work I do. So I can look at this and express by bemusement that I find the entire thing somewhat strange. It seems to me that it's all backwards, that you invent a catchy phrase, Internet of Things, and then you try and discover that there's a problem statement and somehow invent one of those, and then work very hard to generate a solution for your so-called problem statement. Um, it's all computers. It's always been computers. It always will be computers. Some of them are quite big with lots of buttons. I have one here. You probably have one too. Some have fewer buttons. Is there any difference between the two? Not really. What if I embed it all the way so that you never actually see that there's a computer inside there? Still a computer? Of course it is. Any difference? None whatsoever. Same stuff. Exactly the same set of protocols. Why do we use the same set of protocols? Because it's cheap. The protocol's openly available. I can ram it on the same chip. Done. So to my mind, this is like saying that consumer electronics needs governance. That there are real deep and abiding issues about my refrigerator in terms of identity and privacy. That my washing machine somehow needs an EU regulation about how it should operate its on and off button. This is insane. It's just computers. And realistically, all we're trying to do is put forward decent infrastructure to actually allow them to do a little bit more than they currently do. So I do have this refrigerator, and it's kind of cool. It has a motor. It stores my perishable food. And that's really good, and I like its function. What if I whacked a computer in there? Well, it already has one, so what the hell? What if I put IP on there and did Wi-Fi? What could it do? Actually, it could do a lot. If I was in New York two weeks ago, and it knew that there was a storm coming and there was likely to be a power surge, you know, and if it was really good, it would fill up a few tanks of water in its refrigerator and freeze them. So when the power went out, it'd still stay cool for up to two days. I would say, thank you, fridge. That's a really good service. And I would pay a little bit more. Not a lot, because it's just a fridge. But I'd, I'd do that. Does it need governance? I just do not understand where that comes from. Does it need an entirely different DNS? Why, for God's sake? The existing one doesn't work? Of course it does. If you look inside where the DNS is today, you'll find it in all kinds of devices already. And it will continue to go there because A, it's available, B, it's open source, and it's the cheapest way of doing it. Why go and reinvent the wheel every last bloody time? So, no, I find this entire exercise one that really strikes me as the application of bureaucracy to a non-problem. I do not understand why there's any need to actually separate out computers you can see from computers you can't see and somehow claim that this is an entirely separate universe that needs some kind of distinct government mechanism. I, I'm sorry, but maybe it's just my Australian sense of perspective, but I just can't see it. Terribly sorry. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And Megan certainly, you know, wants to reply immediately and clarify some of the issues, probably. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, as I said, I, European Commission communication is foreseen. I never said anything about legislation. There is no intention whatsoever to legislate on Internet of Things. That's never been our intention. The issue that is identified are, are the issues that have been identified by the expert, expert group 
is not a parallel universe, but how Internet of Things and communication, things to things and people to things, has implications for issues like standardization, like uh, personal data protection, etc. It's not to develop uh, or create an alternative universe or to do anything else. It's to look at the issue, identify where and what problems or issues might potentially be there, what needs to be looked at in particular in the European context in the future. It's not at all intended to regulate it or to legislate it or etc. It's a policy review and identification of issues. Let's put it that way. I think that's the best way of identifying the issues. And to come back to your intelligent fridge, uh, I'm sure that uh, you have a fridge that tells you that there's a storm coming, but my fridge would probably tell me stop eating so much chocolate and uh, you're putting on weight and maybe you should think about having fewer carbohydrates in your diet or God knows what it might do. So <laughs> your fridge is probably more friendly with you than mine might be. But the, the point is that I think there is an important consumer protection element in this as well. Uh, and so it's, it's not really anything more dramatic or, or exotic than that. Uh, perhaps the word governance is what makes people a bit concerned and, and upset. And I know that in the other workshop where I'm supposed to be in parallel, uh, they're talking about governance of e-identity. And uh, we say we shouldn't talk about governance of e-identity, we should talk about sharing and interchange, etc. So perhaps the word governance is, is an unfortunate word. Uh, I'm willing to accept that that's perhaps not everyone's cup of tea. I think that's very wise. Words um, matter. But, uh, you know, what we have identified as issues, not probably for governance, is I think there are privacy issues involved, as you said, uh, data protection. For instance, you know, we identified the critical moment if is the object meets the subject, the individual, and then you have a new dimension for tracking and tracing. So that means if you buy shoes and there's an RFID chip, and the RFID chip is not disabled when you pay for the shoe with your credit card, then somebody who has access to the data can follow where your shoes are. And so this raises some concerns you know, among individuals, and you have to look for some safeguards. So not if you are not the expert in privacy, but you are you know, um, uh, the man who says, OK, with this IP version 6 world, you know, we can can do even more and more and more things. You know how you relate from your perspectives and uh, experience from the last ten years um, this debate to uh, the future. <coughs> Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, well, th the experience is only not only from the last ten years, but from the last thirty years. Um, when we don't know the experience that we have, or we have not understood the. Uh, the uh, lessons that we learned from the first internet, so V4, most probably will repeat the same mistakes with the new one too. In the past we had just networks and IP came as an open standard and glued them and we have got the internet. In the internet of things, we don't really yet have an internet of things. We have networks of things. Uh, if you look at the man who uh, defined uh, the word Internet of Things is Kevin Ashton in his work that he did at, at MIT back in 1998 where uh, he worked on the EPC protocol and uh, coined the Internet of Things although nothing was connected to the Internet. At least he had the vision that it should become one of those days to be part of the Internet. But as soon as it becomes part of the Internet then basically anything that we do today with the Internet applies to these things as well. Yeah, I agree with uh, with Jeff, uh, although uh, not not in those harsh terms, uh, because I know he's he puts things uh, so bluntly. Uh, yeah, th so so the the lessons that we ha we have learned from uh, V4, we'll have to apply them to V6 as well as to Internet of Things, and it's a huge educational uh, process that we have to go through. Uh, if it is uh, very obvious to Jeff, it's not obvious to the rest of the world. So 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 we so we have. Uh, uh, something which is quite important is we have seen reluctance of uh, most of these uh, RFID and uh, Zigbee and so on to be re reluctant to move to IP. It's only recently that they started to adopt IP. And IPv6 was even harder for them to accept because uh, they tell you, well, I need customers. They are not yet on IPv6. So they see it from, from a, an immediate adoption uh, perspective. 
Now, the uh, Etsy has started a new initiative called One M2M, so that will create a kind of 3GPP-like uh, standardization effort, at least to get the agents to work together with, with Europe and, and the US in, in a similar fashion, because uh, the fragmentation in Internet of Things is quite uh, huge. Uh, you know, China will have its own Internet of Things protocols, and you will have to adopt them as well if you want to be in their market. In China, you have Econet, which is totally different from what we are doing in our place. And Internet of Things is nothing new. We have multiple proprietary solutions today that exist. So one of the things we need to do is uh, how to make it easy for them to keep their legacy solutions today and then show them a smooth transition to IP. And in the research, we have to look at the next Internet of Things which is you know, how it can be IP directly connected because this is what Jeff said, I can do a lot more with it than if it is just kind of intranet of things. This is what we have today. So they are not totally connected. I still have the option to make it available or reachable by anybody. And still, and I would like to have my privacy and so on. And I think these are the, the issues that need to be addressed. And the solutions we have in the market so far are rather mediocre, if not, not that much, uh, you know, promoting the Internet of Things as it should be. In terms of the DNS, uh, I agree, we, we've got DNS, it's working. Anything which is open source is the best thing that can happen to us. <coughs> but uh, Bob uh, uh, Khan had created what is called the handle system. And the handle system has uh, something that DNS doesn't have, which is authentication and uh, a better uh, mobile authentication so if the device moves around you can still find it and the price is almost zero so for billions of devices that are coming on board I think we, we should maybe add to DNS something like the handle system uh, which is now used in most of the big libraries where you can find the books and the kind of stuff um, Obviously, uh, the DNS world is not going to like it because it's going to take away the money from their pockets. But uh, most probably for the research world, it's a good, good thing to, to look into. That will change a little bit, uh, I think, uh, the security and privacy in that area could maybe enhance it because DNS is still needs to be fixed because it's not fully uh, secure as such. It must probably be too uh, expensive for, you don't want to give DNS to each device as such. So this is an area where I think we should, should do a bit of uh, research. Okay, um, Martin, um, you are a consultant in the Netherlands, but you're also on the board of the Public Internet Registry, the .org. And, you know, while in the discussion there was, you know, uh, okay, if we, at the moment, everything is happening on, dot of, uh, on top of a dot .com domain with CPC Global, TS1, Marcelo Mediano, unfortunately, could also not come because he's uh, busy in, in Brussels. Um, when we had a number of initiatives, um, a lot of these uh, registries were planning to do something, but then they realized there is no, no, no market for it. So that means the only CCTLD which uh, achieved this was from France.fr. They offered the services, but nobody used it. I think .org also appear that, no, we have no interest. But at the same time, you are a consultant. That means how is your perspective of this from the practical point of view of a, a GTLD registry and from your practical experience as a consultant about this um, situation where we are now? Okay, thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, first, um, I am uh, on the board of the Public Interest Registry, but uh, that is not, uh, there's not a position of the Public Interest Registry on this. Uh, we are concerned with DNS, uh, basically, and we're here to serve. Um, from a perspective of uh, the overall picture, uh, I see that the Internet as we know it today is uh, not the same as it's going to be in a couple of years from now, and there's a couple of major drivers to that. And social networks are clearly some, uh, the impact of search engines and how they develop is clearly one. And as I see it, the fact that it, things are going to communicate with us, and I believe increasingly so, also in connection to the internet, uh, will greatly influence how the internet will develop. 
uh, data will become uh, accessible in, in, in some ways and that, that allows services to become uh, uh, available that were never possible before. And I think it's important that we realize that. And uh, even today, uh, there's a lot of talk, Internet of Things, yes or no. Things are going to communicate with us. Things are going to uh, uh, provide data on the Internet, uh, whether we want it or not. And uh, we'd better think about how this works in our infrastructures. Um, we have governance structures, and these governance structures evolve as the Internet changes and should continue to do so. Uh, today we are very much involved uh, with talking in the ICANN circles about how government finds its place where it hasn't had really stepped up before. That's one of the changes. Uh, that's because it uh, affects society. Well, the future changes like social internet, like uh, objects on the internet will affect that as well. So that is going to happen. Who's going to provide uh, addresses for that? Uh, I don't think they need a domain name or something, but, but they will need to have a unique identifier. So much is clear. Um, I, I would just plead to, to next to what we do, go and spend some real time in realizing what it means that objects are becoming part of our ecosystem. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, yes, privacy issues, uh, there's a lot to be said about it. Uh, some people say as soon as there's a privacy issue, uh, stop everything, uh, drop it, don't use those data uh, or protect it or prevent that. I think that's too simple. I do think uh, masses of data more and more will become available via the internet. And I do think society can benefit from that. Uh, it does mean, however, that on privacy issues, we start to get a different debate. We start to make people aware of what becomes possible and, and, and uh, how these things evolve. And there I can see that the sooner we get clear on where we would be happy for that future to go as a human population, uh, the sooner we can make sure that the architecture reflects that and uh, build in uh, uh, possibility to deal with uh, that is there, allowing us to benefit as much as possible from the blessing that availability of all those new data brings and making sure we are aware of the dangers that brings and build in appropriate mechanisms to uh, prevent abuse from this thing that's going to happen, more and more data are becoming available on the internet. Okay, thank you, Martin. May I also now um, invite the audience, you know, to ask questions or to make statements. And, you know, I would like to start with Avri because he was an um, um, uh, um, observer in this process and an actor for many, many years. And um, um, we need a microphone for her. And could you also uh, probably um, reflect a little bit? I thought you, you cannot hear me, okay? Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, and thank you for not having me uh, sit up on the panel or not making me sit up on the panel. I actually have a advantage similar to, um, to Jeff's but sort of the opposite. Um, in that I've managed never to get paid by the U.S. or the EU to think about the Internet of Things. Um, ever since I encountered the Internet of Things, I always was, oh, I like that, just, yeah. Um, ever since I encountered the Internet of Things, I um, have always been totally upset about the name of it because I think the name of it has misled us into thinking that it should be something other than the Internet that it should be something other than another overlay of an application over the internet. But when we look at it that way, we actually see that we've got a couple problems in that, as, as I think it was Latif was saying, um, various people have used different address mechanisms. They, they've started out in different ways. They've formed themselves in different ways. We've seen that the scope of authority that people apply over these, these, these separate networks varies and bridges the, the various networks. So we build, but by calling it an internet of things, we've sort of taken it away from problems that we have in the internet with, with other applications. And so I do think that there are complexities. I think that 
these complexities would actually help us if they were mainstreamed, as it were, into the actual internet discussions, internet discussions on complexity, internet discussions on scaling factors of, 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 of you know, the, the users, the instruments that, that have addresses, on problems with scope of authority. Being both, I mean, being largely American and spending a lot of time being funded by other work in Europe, I've sort of taken two perspectives, although I've been admonished that there isn't a European perspective on Internet of Things. Whenever I tried to say, oh, I was going to work for a while on trying to figure out how to compare the perspectives between the U.S. and Europe on Internet of Things, I would get a, there is no European perspective on your Internet of Things from various people. And, and, and so, but, but the fact is, one group looks at it as this is another overlay over the network, and until we find something that makes it different, then it really is just a problem that we look, should look at. We should look at it as privacy with perhaps a larger scope. We should look at it as addressing and how we deal with multiple addressing formats. We should look at it as authority scopes when they cross other boundaries. So how do we deal with that transnational? How do we deal with the privacy? How do we deal with that? But it seems to be very important that we actually keep it as just one more aspect of the problems we're dealing with in the internet generally. Now, if people at the Internet of Things go and say, you know, V4, not enough addresses for us and, and we can't use it. V6, who knows when that's going to happen. You know, another 20 years perhaps before V6 is globally usable, so we can't really solve it there. If we have people that are saying, listen, we already came up with our own addressing, you know, Internet of Things had its own addressing before V6 was created, before whatever, we want to keep using it, then it does bring up an interesting problem of interneting the, the, the V4 network, the V6 network, which is already something that we do, and whatever network they're using. Now, that's a problem that's been with us in the Internet since the early days of the Internet, when we would have various protocols and, and we would find ways to connect those networks to each other to make things work, to allow things to cross various borders. So I, I think it's an interesting topic, but the more we try to put it in a box called Internet of Things, the more we confuse ourselves. The more we sort of, and in this I guess I almost agree with Jeff, though not with his panache, but, <laughs> but, but I do uh, I agree with the fact that you know, it is bemusing on calling it something different, calling it something special as opposed to just another aspect of the complexity of the network that is evolving. Thanks. Thank you very much, Avri. And um, my understanding from what Megan has said with the plan to have a communication is that the communication should contribute to clarification. And it's like raising awareness that we understand the issue a little bit better. But, you know, I would ask uh, Jeff, you know, um, what he thinks about um, Bob Kahn's um, handle system and the plan now to have this donor, this um, digital object um, numbering uh, authority. Um, you know, is this the right reaction to this and, you know, uh, and how this is related? A lot have said, okay, this will take away something from the DNS, you know. Uh, how far this will go. Unfortunately, Bob is not here, so he cannot tell us about it. And I want to thank Megan for, uh, for coming to us and you know, hope to see you uh, next year again on the IoT workshop here in the IGF in Indonesia. Megan, thank you very much. Jeff, um, what is your comment on Bob Kahn's handle system and the donor? Um, the DNS, despite all appearances to the contrary, has been truly prodigious. It generates billions of dollars a year to all kinds of folk who actually have no idea how the system works or what they use it for. Most of the money inside the domain name registration system goes to names that have no actual functionality on the net. They're just ghosts. The DNS is truly prodigious. Huge amount of money. So what do you do if you want money? 
Well, one way is that you could go and invent an entirely new family of application for the DNS. And then you'd have a captive market for a whole bunch of new domain names. So one could argue that the enum exercise in telephony had nothing to do with telephony, had nothing to do with any kind of bypass mechanism. It was simply trying to sell nine billion new domain names. And at one buck per registration per year, that's a lot of money. And one could argue that IDNs, in a similarly very, very uh, cynical view, is just another way of generating hundreds of billions of new domain names. So it was all just about making money. And one could argue that the Internet of Things was an attempt to try and create a captive market for a new part of the DNS, corral folk in for a dollar per name. And there are so many things and they all need a new name. So one way of doing things is to corral things into the DNS and capture an entire new market and get one dollar per domain name per year because the DNS is truly prodigious. Or you can go and invent your own DNS. Looks like the DNS, smells like the DNS, but you don't have to pay ICANN. And in some ways, the DNS is able to do anything. If you include NAPTAs and SNAPTAs, you actually have a complete regular expression language. You can do everything that handles do. You can actually do relocation. You can actually do, what did Latif say? Um, authentication and replication in the DNS. Uh, authentication, you can do DNSSEC. And there's a huge amount of DNSSEC out there already. It's around 2% of resolvers and it's growing every day. So the DNS is truly capable, but sometimes folk just simply want to go off to one side and create their own prodigious field. And handles is one of it. Yeah, you could do handles in the DNS if you wanted to, if you wanted to. Or you can go and invent your own name system. But every time we have tried to do a new identity system, and God knows we've tried about 20 times over the last two decades, because every time there's new technology, oh, we need a new identification system. You think about its properties and you work through it again and again and again. And ultimately, every single identity system looks a lot like the DNS in the end. And you start asking yourself, why don't we just put it in the DNS? So almost everything we've been able to do lately, oddly enough, has been put in the DNS. And the last and not least has been the effort of Dane in the working group at the IETF which is now putting domain name certificates into the DNS. So this whole massive business of certifying your domain name is now coming to a sunset. And it's now possible to simply self-sign into the DNS and rely on DNSSEC and security in the DNS to do all that. So I'm relatively cynical that handles offer any new semantics that isn't already encompassed in the semantics of the DNS. The DNS is truly prodigious. The DNS also works, which is pretty amazing. And the DNS is almost everywhere. And we're now seeing devices in the DNS. A few weeks ago, the IANA reported that the loads of the root key, the root of all the DNS, had jumped from 4,000 a month to September, where it reached 353 million in one month. What could possibly have caused 353 downloads of the root key of the DNS in September. Started on September the 19th, all the fetches were signed by Apple, and it was the time iOS 6 came out. So now we're seeing hundreds of millions of devices with their own DNS, with their own security, that are now autonomous from their environment. Welcome to the Internet of Things. It's the Internet we're in now. I don't understand the distinction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Latif, you are certainly, I expected that you want to yeah. say something. No, I mean, the, the only difference is, uh, is about money. Uh, the handle system uh, will cost per country $50 a year, period. You've got billions and billions of DNSs. So that's, that's uh, the, the difference. So. And uh, it depends who's going to promote it. It's a, it's a question of marketing. Does uh, Bob can, and I hope uh, he's going to and maybe at least send us a message about what he wants to do with, with Dona, which is uh, <coughs> co-promoted by the ITU, which will create not an issue uh, for sure. Uh, but the ITU is not involved directly. But I think it's uh, for, uh, I would expect for developing countries and so on. This could help in the education sector, in the libraries, uh, in the governments. Uh, so not to be uh, a prey to DNS uh, 
uh, outfits. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good a good thing. We we have it running. It's running with V4 and V6. So so it could. Uh, I mean, it's not the ultimate solution, but but I think it can do the work the same way like the NS is doing it. So. But uh, you know, as I just said, uh, we had 20 of them in the past, and the only one that made it uh, is the NS, uh, uh, because to a certain extent it's open standard. And you know, open standard is something that nobody can fight. You can resist for a decade, but at the end, open standards win. So this is most probably the question is how open the handle system is going to be, and then how the trust mechanism per country who is going to uh, delegate the trust in each uh, country. And I doubt that the government should be the, the trust uh, uh, entity for the trust because you have to, you know, to, to double uh, 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 secure the keys between them. That could take a bit of time to deploy. So, so, so most probably deployment is going to be a factor of either success or failure. Okay, thank you very much. Are there more um, questions from the uh, audience? Please, can you introduce also yourself? Is there a microphone here for the gentleman in the, in the, on, on the second row? Thank you. Can you introduce yourself? Hello, uh, my name is... Uh, am I hearing? Am I, am I yeah, audible? Yeah. My name is Ian Fish. Uh, I'm uh, here on behalf of BCS, the Chartered Institute of... U Institute of IT from UK. Uh, after last year's uh, IGF, I went away and thought to myself, why is there nothing in BCS de dealing with the Internet of Things? Is it such a, a big coming thing? So I set up a working group uh, in BCS, which is an institute in the UK. And uh, we've discussed all sorts of things in the last year. Uh, we never discussed governance for the reasons that have been dis uh, described this morning, because they, we saw it as an integral part of, uh, of the development of governance on the internet as a whole. But one of the things that did come up, and uh, I'd like the panel's view on it if it's possible, it was that there's statistics that show that the majority, the vast majority probably, of interactions of the internet of things when it comes into full operation, and it's not just a, an internet of things as has been described at the moment, will actually be machine to machine. and it seemed to us that in some ways that might affect some of the big issues that you were talking about earlier on. I just wonder if you had any views on that. Um, s somebody wants to, Martin? Uh, no, uh, exactly. Th th this is one of the things that uh, we don't get to talk about because we uh, usually limit ourselves to governance and, and, and privacy. And it's these elements that uh, will affect also the work of the ITF and, 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 and other bodies that, that have to do uh, uh, with the development of the internet. It means thinking ahead of where we're going. And it's so obvious that it's going to happen. And uh, as you said, uh, whereas even maybe the vast majority will be, be uh, communication between things, uh, uh, it still means that it has requirements for how the internet is set up, uh, the load balancing uh, and whatsoever. So let's start recognizing that. Let's start to look, okay, in the governance field, uh, in governments, what they need to do with this new world that is emerging, but also in ITF, uh, IAB uh, and, and other standardization and industrial development platforms, how it's going to happen. I don't think government is going to develop the future internet. Uh, uh, I think we're going to continue to do that bottom up because it's so obvious it's the best way, whatever other people say. Uh, uh, and we need to think of all these aspects and then it's very useful to just accept the fact that this is going to happen and then from that point start checking in your own domains what your role is in there and how you can contribute to that. So I very much agree with you with that. Okay, Trev. Um, you have a laptop. It's there open in front of you. How many processes are running right now? About 250. How many did you start? You're not using it, so you probably started none. Almost all of those processes are machine to machine. You have no knowledge about what they're doing. If you watch your machine boot, it's truly wonderful if you look at the packets. Because all of a sudden you're talking to the DNS, you're bringing in all the peripherals. A whole bunch of things are phoning home pulling down new updates and configs. 
machine to machine is already what we do. It's exactly why we actually manage to make these rich environments where what you see on the screen is actually the amalgam of a massive amount of machine to machine communication. There's no difference between that and my iPhone and between that and what is probably embedded in this somewhere if it ever actually got a clue and did Wi-Fi. So trying to create some artificial distinction between a device that doesn't have a screen and keyboard and one that does or a device that for some reason there's no human nearby all of the time as you think from I occasionally look at my laptop but I must admit the amount of things it does in response to me versus the amount of stuff it does because it's just sitting here there's a lot more that it does because the power is on so this is already a machine it's a thing and it's thing to thing communication like crazy so I find it hard to actually think that the future at that level is any different to what we hear now it's the same stuff and that's why it's so inevitable sooner or later that instead of having a keyboard and a screen you cut down on the buttons reduce the form factor and you go well this one isn't actually designed for humans to really use it's just plug and play I'll just embed it down here how many computers are in your car at least 10 probably 20 now and it'll probably be a hundred in a year's time so you know live with it it's just here it's nothing special and your machinery everything we're already doing right now is full of machine to machine communication it's just what these chips do naturally. <clears throat> I would like to add um, to this, um, if you don't mind. This is where the, we have different standardization bodies, and they invent uh, new names for things that already exist. So machine to machine, invented by Etsy, although that's what the ITF has done for a long time. But Etsy doesn't do internet protocols that's left to the ITF. So, so all of a sudden you have this uh, kind of unusual things uh, that, that are created and invented and even as I mentioned there is one M2M initiative uh, which is basically already what we have so it's, it's uh, beyond uh, what, uh, what Jeff is saying is, is the autonomicity of computing which is wonderful these things just work so it's like the routing around the world it just functions nobody has to push a button you know to see whether the, the packet has gone from A <coughs> to Z from Japan to it's autonomic and this is the beauty of, of the entire internet uh, as such, uh, to enable the, the, these things. Uh, about the future internet mentioned, uh, that's a, not a misnomer we have. We have the internet. What's the future internet? Uh, this is just like saying that the internet we have now is not working, so let's create something new. It's nonsense. Uh, future internet, if you take out the word internet and say future network, I would agree, yeah, that's something new. But future internet, what? What could that be if it's not the internet that we have now? It's just bigger, just maybe faster. No more than that, but still it's the internet. Thank you, by the way. I remember a meeting of the uh, uh, European Commission on the Internet of Things in Prague where the main session discussed the internet is broken. So, and uh, we s are four or five years later and we see it still works and evolves. So, um, you wanted to react to the comments. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I'd just like to come back to Jeff. Uh, I don't actually disagree with him, uh, but I just wanted to explain the context in which my remarks came. And it's actually that this, these aren't really internet problems. They're actually functionality problems. And where it came from was because one of the major uh, drivers of our thinking in our working group were around issues like privacy and uh, and ethics and we foresaw that when functionality increased with lots of uh, of I'm sorry I use the word machine to machine I realize it causes uh, it's just a way of describing it uh, but um, when functionality increases and a lot of it is done machine to machine uh, in things like uh, e-care and e-health and things like that, you start to get ethical and privacy issues thrown up which weren't there before. So it's really a functionality-driven thing which happens to be underlined, underlaid by the internet, by these all these devices going onto the internet. That's how we saw it. I'm also concerned partly about the so-called 
side effects of this machine-to-machine -machine communication. So that means uh, always you are, sometimes you are crazy. If you have your computer, you open it and you start a program and then the computer does what the computer wants and not what you want. So And then, then you feel partly um, uh, occupied by the computer. That means you are not the master of the machine anymore, so the, the machine uh, masters you. And in so far, you know, this, uh, this is should certainly... Run, should run a scanner, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is certainly, you know, and, and, and I, I'm thankful that you introduced the eth ethical dimension in it. So it's a question, you know, what is the relationship in a machine-to-machine -machine communicated world of the individual? Is it just, you know, becomes he integrated into machine-to-machine -machine communication or remains he the master of the processes and the machines work for him or uh, do they develop their own life? So I think this is partly a philosophical question so and uh, also a very real question because it's in the design. So that means the software and all these protocols are made by men and so that means they should be aware about the uh, the, 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 the implications and the probably intended and non-intended side effects. So, uh, so I, I think we did not uh, quickly, we did not answer, answer co correctly his question. Basically what, it, what he meant uh, is that, so if I make it an internet enabled sensor or whatever machine and so on, and he talks to another one using an IP protocol, then yes, then in this case, this is what you want to say. Because currently we have just proprietary solutions that are running and you want to make them internet enabled, this is where maybe uh, machine to machine uh, should be explained. In this case, you will stick an IP address, private or public, whatever you want. We have, for instance, Linz uh, AG, the town, and it has a smart city uh, project, massive one, and they have 60,000 uh, power meters, and they give them global IPv4 addresses. You're gonna chuckle. Uh, and that's the way they want it, because they want everyone to access these devices. Obviously, they found out that the uh, customers at the beginning, they were looking at their uh, iPhones to see the power that they consume and so on. But after one week, nobody was interested anymore. So, so, so there is a bit of a cultural thing to, to, to move into that direction. And, you know, they still say, well, we've got enough V4 addresses. We don't need to have V6, which is another nightmare we have in front of us. So. May I, af, um, may I ask the law professor here, in this machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communication world, is there still a role for law or is this just let it go, it's only protocols and, um, you know, uh, it, I would not say that it's, it's the end of the law, but, you know, what is the role and function of law and uh, uh, public law um, in this um, coming world? Well, as a law professor, I think uh, I need to defend uh, law. Otherwise, I would become uh, unemployed, which would perhaps not be too much of a tragedy because uh, I would have many other ideas for the rest uh, of my life. But I think I would uh, like to step back a little bit. And uh, you most likely heard from my first intervention that I'm not the promoter of a narrow network um, of uh, uh, legal rules. But um, when listening to Chaff and maybe also a little bit uh, exaggerating, I got uh, the impression that uh, some engineers are of the opinion that law is not uh, needed at all. And in, if this would be the statement, then I would uh, in fact object. And I'm really glad that you mentioned uh, uh, e-health because as uh, soon as we come into uh, the field of uh, e-health then even if it is a machine to machine communication and even at, if at first instance uh, a person does not seem uh, to be uh, involved we might be confronted uh, with uh, privacy problems and then uh, we do uh, have a legal issue. Um, furthermore at the end of my first intervention, I very shortly mentioned that we run, uh, we might run into problem with uh, a competition law. Should it be the case that uh, terms of uh, service of a market uh, dominant uh, infrastructure provider are to be accepted without any discussion, without any uh, negotiation? 
isn't it in the public interest uh, that uh, we do have uh, some kind an equal al allocation of rights and uh, obligations and to perhaps be uh, a little bit uh, sarcastic uh, would it be a good idea that Joff gets a very intelligent refrigerator but uh, I get uh, a really some refrigerator not knowing uh, anything I mean, I know that this uh, example uh, doesn't work, but uh, in fact, we also do have something like uh, justice, like uh, equity. And if we look at these issues, then I think even if I would withdraw from a narrow network uh, of uh, legislation, we need to have some basic principles uh, of uh, law applied even after my uh, retirement. Uh, Jeff, could you could you accept this? Well, so far what we've had is a system where the area of telecommunications inherited, I think, its legal perspectives actually from the older world of messaging and postal services. And we developed this rich surroundings of that service with an ethos called a common carrier. That the carrier is not liable for what they carry. The individual sender and recipient are liable for that material and the carrier can move those goods without fear. But sorry, I may intervene for a second. The carrier is liable to do the transport. The carrier is Liable not only to do the transport exactly, and not for the content. The so, so now we see in this new world a whole bunch of folk trying to pull that apart, and the intellectual property of people <laughs> are basically saying the carrier is responsible for everything as long as it concerns our content, which is I find just incredible. But as well as that, we actually find that what's on websites and what's in applications aren't covered because it's not the transmission. I heard a presentation from a US Trade Commissioner about the behavior of the management of your data on a website. And if I understood her correctly, it wasn't a privacy issue. It was whether the website accurately described what it was going to do with your data. And if they said, look, we're going to sell it to the highest bidder and we couldn't give a stuff about your privacy, if they did that, that's okay, because they weren't lying. If they said anything else, we deeply respect your privacy and would never sell your data, and then went and sell it, that's bad. So we actually don't have a legal framework, as far as I can see, that actually puts the same respect for personal data inside other areas where data is collected and aggregated. Book readers, all that stuff coming from Kindle and, and Barnes and & Noble and so on, you buy the books, but they look at you reading them. They know every page you actually spent time on. They know how long you spent reading your page. And in what they call the data exhaust, when you phone home back to the bookshop, your reading habits are sent back to them. That's in another country. That's under an entirely different regime. If it happens to be in the US, it comes under the terms of the Patriot Act. All your data belongs to the US government. But you're a citizen of the EU or a citizen of Australia. What's going on? Let's say I buy this refrigerator and it starts to have little hidden cameras snooping on my house. Who's the problem? The network service provider that provided the Wi-Fi that let the data through? Or is it the refrigerator manufacturer somewhere deep in China or in Korea? Or the application designer that sat somewhere in Taiwan? Or the fridge product manager that was somewhere in Germany? Who knows? So we find in this rather complicated world that yes, we would actually like some protection for individuals, but we have no way of knowing how to apply it. So the best we do is this rather strange system where everyone's meant to say up front what they do, and if you're lying, that's terribly bad. But as long as you're honest about the fact we're going to sell your data to the highest bidder, that's okay. You all use credit cards, they sell their data to the highest bidder. You all use airline frequent flyer points, they sell your data to the highest bidder. So I kind of wonder at this point exactly who cares about this stuff. I'd actually like more protection, and I find the whole legal process lagging about 50 years behind reality. Sad but true. Do you have an answer to this? To do yourself? You ask good questions, but you did not answer it. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I can only say very shortly, of course, uh, legislation is, is um, lacking back, but uh, uh, at least uh, in certain uh, instances, uh, privacy laws are now applicable. We do have a major problem that uh, the level of protection is quite different in the different uh, uh, countries. But uh, uh, 
social networks have been involved in uh, privacy litigations more and more in the recent years. We gain now experiences uh, with such kind of uh, proceedings. Uh, Google and Facebook had to <coughs> at least adapt their policies uh, to a, um, a certain uh, extent. Again, the development is, is, uh, is very slow, but I would not say uh, that the whole uh, efforts are helpless. And as you certainly heard, I have not mentioned as an example copyright that's uh, completely different uh, picture and as soon as we are talking about copyright and uh, patent uh, rights uh, we are of course uh, looking at uh, property rules and uh, other very uh, difficult uh, uh, questions which uh, need to be reflected from fresh in a virtual world. Okay, are there more uh, questions from the audience so that we move now to the end of the workshop? Um, you know, um, uh, I see David Cross in the room now, and uh, you know we we missed Fiona Alexander here, and we had no person from the from the U.S. government or close to the U.S. government, because we discovered that there is a different approach between the European Commission and the U.S. government to the issue of the Internet of Things. And I don't know whether you feel um, um, to be in a position to say some words, you know, how the, uh, in the United States uh, the, the issue of the Internet of Things is seen and treated. Is it a special issue or it's part of the, the broader discussion? Um, could you say some words? or? Okay, thank you. No, uh, no need for it. Martin. Uh, just want to bring one thing back, uh, and that is that uh, the Internet, as it's been developing, and the Internet of Things, however you feel about that name, uh, how, how much more sensors and, and, and things are coming on the Internet, uh, it's all been blossoming up in different areas of the world, and uh, there may be uh, more value in us uh, as society and it may emerge and we may be able to help that by talking about it, by aligning that more, by making sure that uh, if fridges talk, they talk the same language so we can listen if we want to and applications like that can develop uh, in a way uh, that uh, identifiers uh, are consciously there either for the lifetime of a product or just for a face, just for a face. If it's uh, if you don't want it to be there for a lifetime, and uh, sometimes it may be better to have it for a lifetime there in in the right context. So it's these kind of opportunities that uh, arise from technology to society that I would like to benefit uh, from in the best possible way, and that means we need to discuss those as well. Martin, thank you very much. You have more or less already started the final round and the final reflection. So um, if you want to have some final comments and what we should do now in the year ahead, should there be a continuation of the discussion? Should we just say, OK, we close the books about this issue? Um, what would be your recommendation, your advice, what also the Dynamic Coalition um, could do in the next year if we decide to continue with the dynamic coalition. Latif. Yeah, <clears throat> I think this is a very important uh, initiative as it's primarily uh, an educational exercise to explain um, how the internet functions and how the internet of things is going to function, especially to uh, the non-technical uh, lawyers and commission officers and what have you. It's very important for them to understand how this thing functions, because we don't have yet lawyers that have studied the internet. They cannot really fix these things. So we'll have to wait for another generation or two until the guys, they have, uh, you know, internet uh, protocols as part of next to the, the other languages, you know, French and English and so on. They'll be able to be educated right from the beginning and they will be uh, quite um, uh, accustomed to that language. And then we have the most probably talented lawyers that will be addressing these issues. So, so, so in terms of educational exercise, it's very important to continue this work. Thank you, Latif. Jeff, final word. Um, not only is the DNS prodigious, but Moore's law is even more prodigious. 
we can double the number of gates we can put on a chip about every 18 months. We've been doing so for, ooh, about three decades. Computers will become smaller and more powerful and cheaper. All of those things will happen, and the rate is doubling. So we currently wander around with dedicated devices that are communicating devices that store notes, and we think that somehow things are different. In a year's time, this stuff shrinks yet again, that the iPhone becomes smaller and lighter, that you actually find embedding becomes everything, because the internet will no longer be a bunch of specialised devices for people. It's just in the things you use today. So I don't think it's anything special. It's just where we're going. Driven by this sort of need to sort of get smaller and more powerful computing that the industry wants to do, driven by a need to sell at least 10 billion new processors next year, then our environment keeps on changing. And the devices we use become more and more aware of our needs because, quite frankly, we're moving from a command-led economy to a consumer-led economy. Whatever sells, sells. And quite frankly, those devices that become more helpful, understand where they are, understand the language they should use to interact with you, are all about being helpful. We've also found from Google that knowledge about you as a consumer is worth a massive amount of money. So these devices will look at you just as much as you look at them. And they will beam information back home, that's just fine, because quite frankly, that's how you pay for them. So yes, I think the world is changing very rapidly, but I don't think the Internet of Things is any different from the rest of this large-scale computing environment. And it's not the Internet, it's the apps and machines we connect into it. It's always been apps and machines. The Internet was just a really dumb minimalistic protocol that glued them all together. The Internet was never the destination. It was just the means to get to any destination you wanted to get to. So no, I wouldn't make any distinction whatsoever. This is just all about us. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, this could be the very last word because, you know, who can add something? Uh, Martin had already the final word, but the final word should go to the lawyer because he was challenged by Latif and say, we need, uh, have to wait until <laughs> we have a new generation of lawyers which understand it and then will help us to fix some of the ethical and, and, and uh, political and social problems. Um, well, do, do you see this new generation coming? Uh, perhaps surprisingly, I agree with Latif uh, in uh, uh, this uh, uh, sense. And I wanted to say as a final word, we need closer uh, cooperation uh, between uh, engineers, uh, uh, technicians on the one hand, uh, lawyers, uh, economists, social scientists uh, on the other uh, hand. And in fact, this generation of lawyers has grown up uh, without the internet, I would just say uh, in brackets, unfortunately the term internet of things has been invented by an engineer and not uh, by a, um, a lawyer, uh, bracket closed. So I, I think uh, it is really very important uh, that the exchange of knowledge, exchange of uh, information between the technical people and the social scientists uh, um, people uh, uh, is uh, in Improving and uh, somehow black box legislation of lawyers uh, who uh, think that they have uh, found uh, something in a small room will certainly not uh, um, survive. I would assume that uh, the newer, uh, younger generation might know more about uh, the internet, but again, the education is still different. In most countries, it's very different. Uh, whether you are going to a technical university or a social scientist university does make a huge uh, difference. And uh, therefore, I do not think that university as education or other kind of education as such um, is uh, good enough. It uh, remains uh, to be an objective that the people in charge work together, as we try to do here on the panel. Thank you very much. You know, I thank um, all the panelists here, and the uh, um, the uh, thank goes also to the um, uh, speakers from the floor, and give the speakers uh, an applause. And I um, close this session, and we will just you know immediately go now to the meeting of the dynamic coalition, and you know people who are interested to um, you know you know to know more about what the dynamic collision is and
have an interest, you know, probably to continue with its work, should remain in the room. I think the meeting will be very short, not longer than 15 minutes, uh, but, you know, although for bureaucratic reasons, we have to have this meeting and we have to make at least, you know, one decision whether the dynamic collision should continue or whether we should uh, close this and say, okay, uh, we have discussed this issue for a couple of years and now we end it. So that's why people who have an interest in the subject could stay in the room. We make just a three, four minutes break and then continue with the meeting of the dynamic collision. Thank you.